Welcome to Old Trafford, the home of the world's most famous football club, Manchester United. Affectionately dubbed the Red Devils by a massive supporter base, Manchester United is not just one of the most successful sporting teams of all time. It's become a global powerhouse brand. Quick to capitalize on huge advances in media, multimedia and the internet in the 21st century, the club has set the benchmark for success in promoting, selling and showcasing its brand all over the world. The latest figures suggest that at least 139 million fans across Europe, Asia, Africa and America are tuning in each week to the Man U website for news of their hero's progress. The site, which also features MUTV, enables fans who missed the game to catch all the highlights. A comprehensive archive section of the site even gives access to past games and vintage matches at the click of a mouse. This easy access to information has created a global fan base of massive proportions. Estimates put Man United's total figures at around 330 million people, which constitutes a leap of almost 50% in the space of five years. This dedication to their label, combined with their recent success over the last two decades, has enabled Manchester United to reign off the field as well as on. Over the past few years, they've taken on Spanish superclub Real Madrid in the battle to become the world's richest football club. Thanks to its reported annual turnover of well in excess of £200 million, Manchester United has become a force to be reckoned with in the business arena. But such impressive figures are still not enough to satisfy the ambitions of the club's directors up at Old Trafford HQ, who've set their sights on posting an annual profit of £110 million by the year 2011. With the help of the club's former superstar midfielder David Beckham, the Manchester United brand is thriving throughout Asia. Regular visits out east ensure that the connection stays strong and the fans clearly can't get enough of the Red Devils. I came from Hong Kong on the 4am ferry because I want to get a good seat. Asia's exploding economy makes it a key factor in Manchester United's plans for global domination. Another vital ingredient in their recipe for success will undoubtedly be the team's continued brilliance on the pitch. Entitled to lay claim to the title of England's most successful club, Man U has won nine premierships in the last 16 seasons, never finishing lower than third. The team's phenomenal success over recent years is most regularly attributed to the efforts of Alex Ferguson, who signed on as manager on November the 6th, 1986. Since finishing second in the title race for the 1979-80 season, the Red Devils had fallen into a slump. Then manager Dave Sexton led United to an eighth place finish the following season and was subsequently sacked. With flamboyant manager Ron Atkinson now at the helm, Man U seemed to be on the up and up, despite Liverpool's continued dominance of the league. In 1983 and 85, Manchester United was able to win the FA Cup. In the season of 1985-86, the Red Devils were runaway favourites to win the league after winning their first 10 league games and opening an almost insurmountable 10-point gap over their nearest rivals. With their first championship since the 1960s within their grasp, the team crumbled and finished the season fourth. Atkinson and the team failed to recover their form and when United found itself flirting with relegation the following season, Atkinson was sacked. The Red Devils needed a tried and tested winner to leave them out of the doldrums. Alex Ferguson had won every prize that Scotland had to offer during his tenure at Aberdeen, including the European Cup Winners' Cup, 
and he looked like the man for the job. Despite his credentials, Fergie's Man United fared little better than Atkinson's for the first three seasons, with the club finishing 11th, 2nd and then 11th again. However, with so much recent upheaval at the club, the board decided to remain patient with their new manager and his team's up and down form. Inconsistent results were not the only thing on the director's minds throughout the 1980s. Like the rest of English football, Manchester United was facing another huge problem. The problem hailed not from the pitch, nor the boardroom, but from the grandstands. Hooliganism had become rife within the sport right across the country. Organised hooligan firms such as Manchester United's Red Army and Millwall's F Troop, which had sprung up during the 1970s, had grown into full-scale guerrilla factions. Last Saturday, three days after the trouble... It became more and more difficult for the police to quell the violence. United, though, and support... The worst of the hooligans have become much more organised in, in what they do, and they're looking, in a sense, for softer targets. They will choose opportunities, occasions and locations uh, that it's difficult for us to anticipate. And to some extent, this has resulted in a shift of the problem away from its traditional locations, particularly inside football grounds, uh, to other places. In March of 1985, thugs who aligned to Millwall's F Troop were involved in large-scale rioting at Luton when Millwall played Luton Town in the quarter-final of the FA Cup. Then Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher's immediate reaction was to develop a war cabinet to combat football violence. Less than two months later, on May the 11th, 1985, a 15-year-old was killed when a wall collapsed at St Andrews Stadium as fans rioted during a match between Birmingham City and Leeds United. Supporters started fighting when Birmingham took the lead and riot police were called in to stop Leeds fans from pulling down the fencing. Eyewitness accounts put the number of rioting fans at more than a thousand. During the same month, 39 Italian fans were crushed to death during the European Cup final between Liverpool and Juventus at Hazel Stadium in Brussels. Minutes before kickoff, Liverpool fans broke through a line of police officers and ran towards the Juventus fans in an area of Hazel Stadium that contained both Liverpool and Juventus supporters. The sheer force of the Liverpool fans caused the fence separating the two groups to collapse, crushing the Italians. Many of those who died were trying to escape when the wall collapsed on top of them. As a result of the Hazel Stadium disaster, English clubs were banned from all European competitions until 1990, with Liverpool banned for an additional year. Despite the severe penalties and the shocking loss of life, it took another tragedy four years later before real measures were taken to put an end to the problem. In a match between Liverpool and Nottingham Forest during an FA Cup semi-final, 96 fans were crushed to death, 766 injured and 300 taken to hospital as a surge of fans entering the terrace crushed those closest to the ground into the fence surrounding the pitch. Despite an investigation into the disaster, which found it had been the result of poor crowd control rather than hooliganism, the British government introduced the Football Spectators Act, which led to stricter rules regarding stadiums and football memberships. Inside the Hillsborough Stadium, workmen have just finished building 10-foot-high fences, costing £6,000. These will literally cage in the rival Leeds and Manchester fans at opposite ends of the ground. With confidence in the Football Association at an all-time low, stadiums in desperate need of repair, clubs banned from European competition and unnecessary deaths a regular occurrence, the FA was left with no choice but to administer a complete overhaul of the league. After many late-night brainstorming sessions and years of planning at FA headquarters, developments were given a boost by a lucrative £12 million sponsorship deal from Carling, and in 1992, the brand new English Premier League was formed. This new league brought the clean page that both Alex Ferguson and Manchester United were looking for. Their previous form slumps of the first division were no longer relevant, and despite Manchester United taking out the FA Cup in 1990, as well as sharing the FA Charity Shield, 
they were a long way off winning the ultimate glory, the league championship. The first Premier League season saw the arrival of one of the most pivotal players in Man U's resurgence. During December 1992, Ferguson was able to sign Eric Cantona from Leeds United for a mere £1.2 million. The Frenchman, who contributed to Leeds United's First Division Championship in 91-92, was on the verge of greatness. Up until his arrival, Man U had had trouble finding the back of the net, and with Brian McClare and Mark Hughes out of form, Cantona's signing couldn't have been better timed. Combining with the talented Gary Pallister, Dennis Irwin and Paul Ince, as well as budding stars like Ryan Giggs, he brought a crucial spark to the side which finished off the 1992-93 season in sizzling form to become Premier League champions, their first league title since 1967. Their form continued into the next season when the league champions went one better. With help from their new number seven, Eric Cantona, they won the double of the league and the FA Cup for the very first time in their 116-year history. Then, without warning, the 1994-95 season saw Manchester United lose their firm grip on the Premier League Championship. Many believe that dropping to second place in both the league and the FA Cup was a direct result of Eric Cantona's eight-month suspension for jumping into the crowd and assaulting a Crystal Palace fan who'd abused him at Selhurst Park. The eight-month ban left a massive hole in Man U's lineup, and as rumours spread that the fiery Frenchman might leave England altogether, Ferguson used his best persuasive techniques to keep King Eric at Old Trafford. His next move was to sell some of the team's key players and replace them with players from the club's youth team, including David Beckham, Gary Neville, Phil Neville and Paul Scholes. The decision outraged fans and commentators alike. Television football specialist Alan Hansen famously warned, you'll never win anything with kids. However, the new players did surprisingly well, and United won the double again in 1995-96. After finishing second to double-winning champions Arsenal the following season and losing Cantona to retirement, some commentators were predicting an end to the Red Devils' red-hot form, but they bounced back bigger and better in 1998-99. Manchester United pulled off the most successful season in English football history by becoming the first English team to win the treble, Premiership, FA Cup and UEFA Champions League in the same season. After narrowly losing the title the season before, the 1998-99 Premier League season was a very tense and highly contested battle between Manchester United and Arsenal. The championship was decided on the final day, where Man U won the title by beating Tottenham Hotspur 2-1. Winning the Premiership secured the first part of the coveted treble, and in the lead-up to clinching the FA Cup final, the players did their best to ignore the added pressure. Obviously, there is a lot of pressure still on because people are talking about trebles, but you know we're just concentrating on winning you know, each game and taking each game as it comes. In the FA Cup final, United faced Newcastle United and won 2-0 with goals from Teddy Sheringham and Paul Scholes. The stage was set for the last match of the season, the 1999 UEFA Champions League final. With the double in the bag, Manchester United needed to beat Bayern Munich to complete the Holy Trinity. Fans were confident that United would make history by beating the Germans. We're going to do it. We are the team. We are definitely going to win. Aren't we, lads? Yeah. Yeah. In what has since been labelled one of the greatest comebacks of all time, Man U went into injury time in the second half, a goal behind. Out of nowhere, they pulled out two spectacular goals to win the match 2-1. For his part in making English football history, Ferguson was knighted. 
At the turn of the millennium, Sir Alex Ferguson had created the best football side that England had ever seen. The Red Devils had come a long way from their humble beginnings as a working man's social team way back in the 19th century. In 1878, Newton Heath LYR was formed by Lancashire and Yorkshire railway workers looking to let their hair down with a weekly game of football. The matches became slightly more competitive when they joined the Football League in 1892. However, by the turn of the century, they'd already been relegated to the second division. Plagued with financial problems from day one, Newton Heath looked destined for early extinction until local brewery owner John Henry Davies put up some much-needed cash in return for an interest in the club. This led to a name change, and after Manchester Central and Manchester Celtic got the thumbs down from members, everyone agreed on Manchester United. After returning to the first division, they started their trophy haul by winning the championship in 1907-08. In 1908, they also won their first charity shield, beating QPR 4-0. The following year, they continued their winning streak by taking home their first FA Cup, beating Bristol City 1-0 in the final. With form on their side, things looked bright for Manchester United. Now they needed a decent home ground. Building commenced in 1908 with the help of architect Archibald Leach, and by 1910, the club had moved from their old home at Bank Street to their new ground, Old Trafford. The first game played at Old Trafford was on February the 19th, 1910, where United were defeated by visitors Liverpool 4-3 in a thriller in front of 80,000 cheering fans. Their new home paid immediate dividends when they clinched the league championship for the second time in 1910-1911. That victory turned out to be the last thing the Manchester United fans had to cheer about for a long time. In the lead-up to the First World War, they suffered such poor form that they were almost relegated to the second division. The decline in form continued when football resumed after the war. Man United hit rock bottom in the 1921-22 season when they won only eight out of 42 games and endured relegation to the second division for the second time in their history. After three seasons in the lower division, the Red Devils finally made it back to the first division at the end of the 1924-25 season. However, without any real superstars in their ranks, Man United continued to struggle, finishing 15th, 18th and then 12th in the closing years of the decade. The 1930s saw no improvement at Old Trafford. In fact, things got worse. Those fans who'd celebrated the upturn at the beginning of the century were now faced with some of the most challenging times in the club's history. At the end of the 1930-31 season, Manchester United ended up with 27 losses after conceding 115 goals. Yet another relegation to the second division rubbed salt into their gaping wounds. With supporters refusing to witness another miserable loss, the first game of the following season attracted just 3,507 die-hard fans to Old Trafford. The situation only got worse as the season wore on, and by December 1931, Manchester United could not afford to pay their players. This time, their knight in shining armour was a businessman named James Gibson, who made his money making army uniforms. Thanks to his injection of £30,000, Man U made a last-ditch attempt to dig themselves out of trouble. It turned out to be a long, hard roller coaster. It took three long seasons to drag themselves back up to the first division in 1935-36. The following season, they found themselves relegated again, only to be promoted the season after. In 1938-39, they finally achieved some stability and held on to their spot in the first division as football was once again halted by the outbreak of the Second World War. 
The resumption of the game after World War II brought with it the signing of Matt Busby as the club's manager and thus began a new glorious era for the Red Devils. Despite the fact that Old Trafford had taken a direct hit during a German air raid in 1941, which had destroyed the main stand, dressing rooms and offices, there was a new sense of optimism at the club. His revolutionary management ideas, which had been gleaned during his service in the war, saw him fail to land a job with his former club, Liverpool. However, the board at Man U were more than happy to accept Busby and his innovative leadership style. He insisted on picking his own team and coaches, as well as directing the team's training sessions, roles that had previously fallen to the board's directors. He also appointed Jimmy Murphy, whom he'd met during the war, as his right-hand man. The Busby-Murphy combination found immediate success with a side consisting of a mixture of young local players and experienced footballers. They finished second in the championship in 1946-47, the first season after the war. This second placing was Man United's best result in 36 years. The horrors of the yo-yoing 30s seemed to be behind them. Busby's side won their first trophy the following year when they beat the formidable Blackpool lineup of Stanley Matthews, Stan Mortensen, and Harry Johnson in the 1948 FA Cup final. This sweet victory came 39 years after United's previous FA Cup win in 1909. It was the first major trophy the Red Devils had won since the league championship in 1911. With confidence and hope flooding back into Old Trafford, Busby led Man U to five great seasons following the war, including four second-place finishes and one fourth. Belief that their beloved Red Devils were on their way to claiming that elusive league title brought fans flooding back to Old Trafford in their thousands. With more than one million people flowing through the turnstiles during the 1947-48 season, the past financial troubles were now a distant memory, and the Red Devils could focus on claiming the championship. Realising that he couldn't rely on his experienced players forever, Busby got into the habit of breaking in new players. And that day they came within an ace of bringing off the dump. Jackie Blancheflower and Roger Byrne were the first of many to take centre stage and were quickly labelled babes by the press. United were already in their debut season, 1951-52, United won the league championship for the first time since 1911. Busby had succeeded where so many had tried and failed. The maestro of Manchester United had groomed a team great enough to beat Europe's best. Despite knowing that the development of the new players would take time, he stuck to his new youth policy and saw the side slide down to finish eighth in the 1952-53 season. However, his strategy paid off three years later when, with a side whose average age was just 22, Busby's Babes won the championship again, scoring 103 goals along the way. Manchester are the youngest cup team ever, and Roger Byrne gets it away. The Busby Babes continued their great run of form the following year, as they won the league again and reached the FA Cup final, where they lost to Aston Villa. The young side was full of talented players, the most notable of whom was a young man who excelled for club and country, Duncan Edwards. Clearly a natural of the game, his raw talent and surprisingly mature football brain won him a berth on United's first team. During April 1953, he became the first division's youngest ever player at the age of 16 years and 185 days. Despite his incredible youth, it's been said that young Edwards could play any position on the field with ease, and those who saw him play believed he was one of the greatest players ever to grace a football pitch. He could do anything. He could uh, manipulate the ball any way that he wanted to. If you wanted him to smash a 70-yard crossfield pass, he would pinpoint a 70-yard crossfield pass. He loved scoring goals. He was just the complete player. One match that symbolised the Busby Babes was played at Highbury against Arsenal on February the 1st, 1958. In front of a crowd of 63,578 screaming fans, the Red Devils defeated Arsenal in a nine-goal heartstopper that included goals from Edwards, Taylor and Bobby Charlton. 
Sadly, what was arguably their greatest game on English soil was to be the last for the Busby Babes. After the match at Highbury, the Babes headed off to Europe to play the second leg of a tie against Red Star Belgrade. A fine centre, and Bobby Charlton slams the ball home. It was just the, the end of a dream, really, in, in a way, because we were so excited. The team was so excited about doing well. And we, we'd not been playing in Europe very long. And, uh, and it was a tremendous adventure. In true Busby Babe fashion, they won 5-4 on aggregate, but celebrations for the victory were cut short by unspeakable tragedy. On the return flight to London after their European Cup clash with the Yugoslavian team, Manchester United's chartered plane made a scheduled stop at Munich to refuel on the freezing cold afternoon of February the 6th, 1958. After two failed attempts at taking off from the airport, the pilot tried again. With slush covering the end of the runway, the plane failed to build up enough speed to reach an adequate height. With nowhere to go, it ploughed into the fence surrounding the airport and then into an unoccupied house. The port wing and part of the tail were torn off and the house caught fire. The left side of the cockpit hit a tree and the right side of the fuselage collided with a wooden hut, inside which was a truck filled with tyres and fuel which exploded. The initial impact was estimated to have occurred at just under 200 kilometres an hour. The 44 passengers on board included journalists, supporters and the current Manchester United starting lineup. Onlookers feared the worst. Miraculously, 21 out of the 44 passengers survived the horrific crash. Among the dead were eight Manchester United players and three of the club's staff. Great players like Byrne, Coleman, Jones, Pegg, Taylor, Jeff Bent and Liam Whelan all died at the scene. Roger Byrne killed. Bill Whelan killed. Young football prodigy Duncan Edwards was to die of his injuries 15 days later in a German hospital. Edwards was just 21. The disaster plunged the club and its home city, along with the entire football community, into a long period of mourning. Many believed that Manchester United would never fully recover from the physical, psychological and emotional wreckage of such a terrible tragedy. If there was a shred of inspiration that could be salvaged from the crash, it was the remarkable survival story of a young Bobby Charlton, who was dragged from the burning plane by United's goalkeeper, Harry Gregg. I, I don't understand why, why I, 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 was, I was OK, you know, and, uh, and they, were, they were killed. I, I never come to grips with it. I, I see quite a, a few of the relatives, you know, from time to time, and I, and I, I do feel a, a little bit guilty. I mean, I can't, I can't help it, unfortunately, but uh, it's, um, it, was, it was an unbelievable tragedy, um, and um, I hope it never happens again. In a recent commemoration of the disaster's 50th anniversary, Sir Bobby stood with fans, officials, and other survivors of the tragedy and reminded everyone that their friends were lost in the crash and live on in their hearts. The many plaques already placed at Old Trafford and at the scene of the Munich disaster were joined by more tributes to those who died in the tragedy. Matt Busby, who'd also been badly injured in the crash, was not given much hope of survival by the Munich doctors. At one point, things looked so grim for the manager that a priest was called to read him the last rites. Miraculously, however, he recovered and was finally released from hospital two months after the crash. The reverberations of the Munich air disaster were felt so deeply back at Old Trafford, rumours began circulating that the club was set to fold and withdraw from all competitions. However, with Jimmy Murphy holding the fort while Matt Busby recovered from his injuries, it was business as usual. In fact, they went all the way to the FA Cup final for the second consecutive year, although they were to be pipped to the post by Bolton Wanderers. At the end of a season that saw one of the best teams of all time ripped from the game before reaching their prime, Man United finished second in the title race. A truly remarkable feat.
Despite the team's great effort, most commentators felt that the real glory days of the Busby Babes had ended with the Munich air disaster. Busby had done amazingly well to recover from his injuries and cobble together an impressive side, but most doubted he could resurrect the success of his treble winning team. However, Busby had more faith in his own ability and the talent of the players he brought to the club. The start of a new decade helped clear away the cobwebs of the 50s and gave Busby a fresh perspective. And throughout the early 60s, he set about creating another team that would etch its name into the history books. Munich survivor Bobby Charlton was clearly putting his hand up to play a key role in the club's future success. Dennis Law was also an important figure during this period. Busby had bought Law to Manchester United via a £115,000 transfer from Torino. Manchester United's fortunes almost mirrored the pattern of the previous decade. As the young players were settling in, the club's form in the first few seasons of the 1960s saw lots of ebb and flow. It was at Wembley during the 1962-63 FA Cup final that the new-look Busby team finally clicked and defeated Leicester 3-1. This victory brought a new air of confidence to the young team and the following year they mounted a strong challenge for the championship. In the end, they narrowly lost the title race to Liverpool, who took out the championship by just four points. But the Red Devils had put the world on notice but they were back in the race. Another important signing was made during the 1962-63 season. This time it was George Best who made his way to Old Trafford. When scout Bob Bishop discovered him, aged 15, his telegram to Matt Busby read simply, I think I've found you a genius. Best's debut in the same season saw the teenager from Belfast wow the crowds with his incredible skill and pace, and his unbelievable ball control left opponents in knots. Along with his phenomenal footballing ability, Best's chiselled good looks, boyish charm and love of a good party were destined to make him the game's first real superstar. In the 1964-65 season, Best, together with Law and Charlton, took United back to the top of English football. They won the league championship, narrowly beating Leeds on goal difference, and reached the semi-finals of the FA Cup. Law was a goal-scoring machine, thanks to the playmaking skills of new recruit George Best and Bobby Charlton. Law was deservedly named the European Footballer of the Year. Looking to continue their great form, United struggled to replicate the success of the previous season. They finished an unsatisfactory fourth and exited the FA Cup and the European Cup in the semi-finals, and the year of 1965-66 was one of disappointment. The 1966-67 season offered a chance for United to redeem themselves, and they did it in spades. Crowned league champions again, their success gave them another shot at the all-important European Cup. After many semi-final losses, the 1968 European Cup was Manchester United's opportunity to kick the habit. With Best and Charlton in career-best form, United went all the way, beating Benfica in the final at Wembley. United won the match 4-1 with goals scored by Charlton, Best and Brian Kidd. Only 10 years after Matt Busby had seen his dream team destroyed, he'd done the impossible, and he was knighted soon afterwards. Manchester United had been the first English club to secure the coveted European Cup. Matt Busby's European Cup winning side was also to go down in history for containing three European Players of the Year, namely Bobby Charlton, Dennis Law and George Best. To this day, fans, commentators and current legends of the game are inspired by the feat achieved by Matt Busby and his team. The rebuilding of the team by Sir Matt Busby to 10 years later to win a European Cup and doing it the right way has sent a message to every Manchester United team thereafter. There is a, a way to do it and I think we try to do that the best we can because without question that period of Manchester United 
It's fantastic history. The following season saw the new European champions suffering from a hangover. They finished 11th in the league and failed to win a single trophy. Despite the anticlimactic end to the decade, United fans had plenty of fond memories of the 1960s. After achieving what no manager had ever achieved before in the wake of such a tragic loss, Sir Matt Busby had made himself a pretty hard act for any new manager to follow. After 25 years at the helm and having lifted Man United out of serious debt, Sir Matt Busby retired in 1969, ending a remarkable era at Old Trafford. Not surprisingly, the Red Devils had great difficulty finding someone to fill Sir Matt Busby's shoes. Despite inheriting a team that had achieved great dominance in 1968, new manager Wilf McGuinness struggled in the position. The team seemed to lose interest after Busby's departure. In many ways, he'd been the heart and soul of the Red Devils, their comfort in their hour of need. The club that had shown such a strong sense of unity was now showing signs of ageing and cracks started to appear. Wilf was relieved of his duties in late 1970 and Sir Matt was reinstated as part-time manager to settle things down. Irishman Frank O'Farrell replaced Busby in June 1971, but like McGuinness, could only eke out a short stay. During his tenure, however, O'Farrell did try to stem the flow of poor results by bringing in some new faces to the team. Tommy Doherty's managing career at Old Trafford lasted longer than his predecessors. He was faced with a difficult task of replacing the stars of the 1960s as their declining form and advancing years forced many of them to leave the club. First, it was Sir Bobby Charlton who announced his retirement at the end of the 1972-73 season. Then, his partner in crime, Dennis Law, was given a free transfer in July 1973 to cross-town rivals Manchester City. Although George Best continued to play at the club, his European Cup-winning form had become a distant memory since his football career had taken second place to his off-field antics. The loss of such great players left gaping holes in Man United's lineup. Their 1973-74 season was a huge challenge for the club, and relegation was a real threat. To make matters worse, Best was sacked from the club during January of 1974, and with the trio of Best, Law and Charlton gone, Manchester United were relegated at the end of the season. To the players and Doherty's credit, the Red Devils bounced back quickly after their relegation. Keen not to emulate the yo-yoing fortunes of the 1930s, they won the second division championship or were back to first division for the 1975-76 season. Reaching the FA Cup final in 1976, they showed great signs of improvement. However, they lost the final to Southampton. In 1977, they reached the final again, and this time they won the FA Cup against the much-fancied Liverpool 2-1. This victory put paid to Liverpool's aspirations of winning the treble, although they eventually went on to win both the league championship and the European Cup. After a scandal involving Doherty, United were forced to sign their fifth manager in a decade. Dave Sexton filled the position and set about developing a more defensive game style. Fans used to enjoying the attacking game fostered by Busby and Doherty found it hard to appreciate the team's new tactics. With Sexton's defensive game plan in place, Manchester United made little headway up the table. Midway finishes became the norm and during Sexton's tenure, the club made and lost one FA Cup final and managed one second-place finish in the league. By 1981, the fans and directors had had enough and Sexton was sacked. Red Devil diehards were beginning to wonder whether the board would ever find anyone capable of reviving Matt Busby's precious legacy. When it seemed that all hope was lost and that Man U was headed for another 40 years of mediocre football, the directors took a chance on a young Scottish manager who knew what it took to win games.
1986, Alex Ferguson was signed to Manchester United. The new manager at Old Trafford had won every prize that Scotland had to offer at his former club, Aberdeen, and the Red Devils were keen for him to repeat his winning ways at the Theatre of Dreams. After a slow start, Ferguson claimed the 1989-90 FA Cup. Then, in 1992-93, the inaugural season of the new Premier League, United won the league championship for the first time since Busby had pulled it off in 1966-67. Over the next seven years, Ferguson's United won five out of a possible seven league championships, including three FA Cups and the elusive treble in 1998-99. Manchester United were once again the dominating side of the competition, and a new dynasty was born. The year 2000 did nothing to disturb the trophy-winning form of the mighty Red Devils. Showing no signs of being bitten by the Millennium Bug, they won the league championship in both 1999-2000 and 2001, taking their consecutive title haul to three. They also took part in the inaugural World Cup championship in Brazil, which would see them miss the 1999-2000 FA Cup. Manchester United today agreed in principle to accept an invitation to take part in the inaugural World Club Championship to be played in Brazil on the 5th to the 14th of January 2000. This is subject to contractual issues still to be resolved. As a result of the commitment, we feel as a club that we have no alternative but to accept the Football Association's offer to withdraw from the FA Challenge Cup competition for one year only. Despite their clear dominance, the press dubbed these seasons as failures because the team didn't manage to claim any more silverware. The media were particularly negative about the club's performance in the European Cup, in which they'd failed to repeat their blistering form of 1999. To stop the rot, Ferguson tried to adopt a more defensive style. However, like Sexton before him, this style not only failed to impress the fans, it also failed to win games and Manchester United finished the 2001-02 season in third place. The following season saw them regain the league title, but they were unable to continue their good form into 2003-04. Despite winning the FA Cup for their 11th time, defeating Millwall in the final, it was Arsenal who were declared league champions, as Man U were once again left languishing in third place. With the good form of the past decade slipping away from them, they finished the 2004-05 season without winning a single trophy. With Manchester United's on-field performances failing to create headlines, it was the club's off-field activities that made the news. A takeover bid by American businessman Malcolm Glazer took the fans' minds off Man United's poor playing form and focused their attention on attempting to stop the Yankee from seizing control of their beloved Red Devils. Their protests fell on deaf ears as Glazer acquired a controlling interest of the club through his investment vehicle, Red Football Limited. Glazer's takeover, valued at an estimated £800 million, took effect on May 12, 2005. Four days later, he increased his share of the club to 75% to delist it from the stock exchange and turned Manchester United into a private entity. Back on the field, United's underwhelming form continued into the 2005-06 season. Losing midfielder Roy Keane to Celtic after he'd publicly dissed several of his teammates only added to their woes. The season saw them fail to qualify for the knockout phase of the UEFA Champions League for the first time in over a decade. They went out to Portuguese team Benfica. Other cruel blows came with injuries to key players like Alan Smith, Ryan Giggs and Paul Scholes, which didn't help the cause. Despite the challenges, they were determined not to finish another season empty-handed and dug deep to win the 2006 League Cup. 
beating newly promoted neighbours Wigan Athletic in the final 4-0. Their second place finish in the Premiership ensured United of automatic Champions League qualification. At the end of a tough season, their main striker and top goal scorer Ruth von Nistelrooy left the club after a row with Alex Ferguson and fans were worried that this loss would only deepen their problems. However, after years of coming agonisingly close to reclaiming the Premiership, Ferguson returned to the attacking style of football that had seen Manchester United dominate English football during the 90s. He also drafted young players into the starting lineup, which brought a new sense of excitement around the club. Players like Wayne Rooney and Cristiano Ronaldo thrived with their newfound responsibility. Scoring came easily to the Red Devils, who seemed to fare better with a more attacking game. In great form, talks of a second treble flooded the football community. However, an all-conquering AC Milan were determined to put paid to any Manchester United dreams of a second treble. Despite playing well, United lost to AC Milan 3-5 on aggregate. The Red Devils' only consolation was the on-fire form of youngster Wayne Rooney. Four long years after claiming their last title, Man U clawed themselves back to finish on top of the Premier League on the 6th of May 2007 after Chelsea drew with Arsenal. The draw left the Blues an unbridgeable gap of seven points behind with two games to go. This Premiership title was Manchester United's ninth win out of 15 seasons of Premier League football, a truly remarkable record. The 2007-08 season saw the emergence and immediate dominance of a new star lineup at United. Portuguese winger Cristiano Ronaldo put together a record-breaking season, kicking 42 goals. He won the Barclays Golden Boot, the UEFA Champions League top scorer title, and the European Golden Shoe for finishing with the highest number of goals scored by a European player in club football. Teammate Wayne Rooney also had an impressive year as he and Ronaldo tore apart the opposing defence with ease. Despite a poor start to the season, which saw them down in 17th place after three matches, United bounced back to win back-to-back -back Premier League titles. The club also reached the European Cup final for the third time in their history, having knocked out star clubs like Barcelona and Roma en route to the final. In the first leg of the 2007-08 Champions League semi-final against Barcelona, it was Ronaldo who made all the difference, despite missing a crucial penalty. Sir Alex was more than pleased with his performance. Maybe asking Wayne Rooney to play a different position and also Jason Park, a different type of role from what he normally does, put an onus on us uh, more to the defence and the attack because I thought in Ronaldo we had the player who could win the match. He was an absolute threat the whole night for uh, us. To, and I think that if we'd have got the better support from him, I think we would have won. Ronaldo himself was philosophical about the missed penalty. Well, it's not a problem. Sometimes you score, sometimes you miss. I missed today, no problem. Um, if you have a second opportunity in, in Manchester, if you have a penalty, I try to score again. Well, the football is like that. Sometimes you miss, sometimes you score. Not a problem. In the 2007-08 Champions League final against league rivals Chelsea, Cristiano Ronaldo scored the opening goal after 26 minutes. Less than 20 minutes later, Chelsea equalised and the match ended one all after extra time. The league final was to be decided by a penalty shootout. Despite missing an early penalty, it was Chelsea's John Terry who was the first to crack under the pressure. He slipped on the pitch and shot wide. Manchester United emerged victorious, winning 6-5 on penalties. 
With this win, they earned their third European Cup title and maintained their record of never having lost a major European final. Coincidentally, this season marked the 100th year since Manchester United had won their first league title. It was also the 50th anniversary of the Munich air disaster and it had been exactly 40 years since Manchester United had become the first ever English side to win the European Cup. This victory didn't... With Ferguson at the helm and a brilliant young side at the start of their playing careers, the future continues to look bright for Manchester United. However, as Sir Alex knows, there's no room for complacency. In the wonderfully checkered history of the Red Devils, he's inherited a rich legacy and an invaluable lesson in the fickle fortunes of football. In all-conquering on-field form and leading the way in marketing, merchandising and ticket sales, there seems to be no stopping the Manchester United steam train. If the Red Devils stay on track, it's just a matter of time before the club founded by railway workers powers all the way to becoming the richest club on the planet. Oh, my God.